I sit down, I light one up, and pour myself a drink, and I am found that it picks me up, it gives me time to think. It's been a long day, you know it's true. But I'm feeling right at home And now I must say That time is due Let's get on with the show Not just blowing smoke Hello, everybody, and welcome to Not Just Blowing Smoke, coming at you live from Twin Smoke Shop Studio Headquarters in rainy, cool Hooksit, New Hampshire. We are streaming live on Facebook and YouTube, and if you are watching on either of those places, please make sure you hit the subscribe button there. If you're listening after the fact on Podbean, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, iTunes, Google, or wherever else you may have found this, Make sure you hit that subscribe button so that you don't ever miss a thing. I'm Pastor Padrone. I'm here with my co-hosts, Pat and Dave. Yo. Bree, a.k.a. Debris from the 724 Lounge, is on her way, and she will be here shortly. We are looking at, uh, tonight, a couple of yearly releases, uh, limited yearly releases. Both of these happen to be in their seventh year of release which was totally unplanned, but uh, I think that's kind of cool. And the first thing we're doing, of course, is this, the Black Label Trading Company's Bishop's Blend. And tonight we are looking at their uh, Corona Largo uh, in this year's release. James Brown, the creator of Black Label Trading Company, said about uh, this line of uh, cigars being released this year, we're very excited about this highly anticipated release. This is the seventh release of Bishop's Blend and continues to be one of our most sought after limited annual releases. Bishop's Blend boasts big, bold flavors of anise, pepper, raisins, and a sweet earthiness on the finish. It is a very complex and extremely refined. Oh, I, I guess I put the Anne in there on my own. It wasn't his grammatical stuff. Um, as with past vintages, the broadleaf fillers shine at the forefront and are perfectly balanced by the Nicaraguan filler tobaccos. Uh, it has a, a Ecuadorian Habano Maduro wrapper, uh, Ecuadorian uh, Habano binder, and then fillers from Connecticut, Nicaragua, and Pennsylvania. Um, the Corona is 6x46. In fact, that's what it says on the box. Bishop's Blend, 6x46. And... Um, we are having Woodford Reserve with the cigar tonight, and it'll be interesting to see how the pairing goes. It should be pretty good, but um, I know we're just getting started here, but what are some of the things you're picking up from the cigar? Are they in line with Mr. Brown's words, or are you uh, picking up different stuff? Do you agree, disagree? Wow. Yeah, it's kind of it's like a dry smoke in the beginning. You get like a dark kind of oak wood on the forefront. There is like a sweetness there. It's saying raisiny sweetness, but it's kind of like a it's like a figgy sweetness to me. Figgy you know, sweetness. Like a, you know, yeah, kind of figgy. And then it has like a really nice like black pepper both on the palate, kind mm. of residing there. And then on the retro hair, obviously, there's a pretty good amount of pepper. Mm -hmm. Which and then the, I think the sweetness to me is more of like a like a hickory sweetness though it's like i can see where the raisin is but to me it's like that kind of oak wood kind of mashes more of the sweetness yeah raisin does not come to mind when mm. i smoke this um definitely lots of black pepper spice especially on the retro yep dark cocoa some dark espresso notes uh there's a hint of sweetness as you smoke the cigar i think it does have a dark sweet finish but i kind of hesitate to use the word raisin Mm. Um, Dave, what about you? Do you agree with raisins or not? 
Um, <clears throat> I feel like I do get a little bit of raisin with it, but I think it's more, more, I get more of the hickory. Um, definitely the black pepper on the retro hill. Oh yeah. Be that's careful everywhere. with this one. This is a, this yeah. is a very strong cigar. Mm. Um, one of the things I am just really amazed at is mm -hmm. that <laughs> the first week of September is almost over. Mm -hmm. Time Wait. flies. Time flies. The summer has just flown by. Does it do that for the two of you? Is time just kind of you look at you you look around and you say, "Where did the month go?" Yes, and it's it's gonna it's uh it's gonna get worse. Why do you think it's going to get worse? Well, um, because as you're, it's as because you, live, you have like four it, fingers you, of uh, Woodford there, Dave. <laughs> it could be, but also because of as you're, you know, as you're growing older and your perception of time changes with how old you are. So you, the longer you are alive, the more perceived time you have, and it becomes, you know, a year. Go, the years go by faster and faster and faster. So you you think that my you're you're telling me my issue here is the fact that I'm old. old. Yes. It's it's uh it's it's actually like a um a proven thing. I watched a a proven a, thing. Yeah, I watched a whole episode from Neil deGrasse Tyson on the passage of time and who is Neil deGrasse Tyson? What? He's like you heard me. Who is Neil deGrasse Tyson? He's like, he's like the next Stephen Hawkins. You mean Hawking? Hawking, whatever. Hawkins is like a fictional character from. Well, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So he uh he does a lot of YouTube stuff, and uh, uh he did an episode podcast on uh, time uh, passage of time. And why you feel like the days are getting faster. And it's basically because you're, when you're a child, you know, you only have like a couple of years. So it seems like the summers and the days last forever. But when you're an adult, it just blurs by because you have all that history. Why does history change your perception of time? I, it's a legit, I'm, I'm asking a legitimate question. I'm not trying to be a jerk. No, it's like, you know, your your perception, you've seen it. It's like anything else that you do. It's uh uh the first time you cut a you cut an apple, mm -hmm. you know, your it takes longer than the next time. And the next time gets quicker and quicker. It's just like anything else. But learning a skill and and see feeling like a month goes by in the space of a week. Well, you've to experienced me, many months. Things. And so now the experience gets, you know, it all gets uh you know, when you have like 500 days in you know, versus 50,000 days, you know, one day is going to be next to nothing. Your whole day is planned up and, you know, it flies by. I'd you love know? to know what the audience thinks. I'd love to hear some comments here on mm. what you think about the fact that the older you are, the faster the years, the months, the days go simply because you have more experience of time behind you because that's that's going to get freaky for me mm. if that's true is that true for you pat i mean i, I don't really, you're the you're the youngest here by like half i don't really correlate it with age to me it's like i'm in like a busy time of my life right now so i think that's probably why it's so we have a comment mashing. we have a comment from uh brad christie i haven't seen that guy in a while so there's one day as a one-year-old, is one three hundred and sixty-fifth of your life. When you're fifty, it's one eighteen eighteen thousand eighteen hundred eighteen hundred two hundred fiftieth of your life. Dave is spot on. Does he say like baking spice part. in that anywhere? No, no, no baking spice. I did though. Can you read, Dave? No, apparently I cannot. Can you read that? No, but I'm like 12 feet away from your little monitor, so I feel justified. All right, so you guys, Brad, you think this is legit? Do you think this is legit? The reason that the months seem to be going by 
for those of you in Rio Linda, Brad is sitting in front of us. Uh, he's part of the audience here. We have a, we've been having an audience for the last several weeks, um, whether we want it or not. <laughs> um, but uh, but you agree with this? You, you that the older you get, the faster time appears to go because you're older. I'm also pretty more... sure he's heard of Neil deGrasse Tyson too. <laughs> See the only the only thing that's good about this to me is that it means next summer is going to come a lot quicker than it did yes. years ago. Yes, you know? it will. But you know the year is going to fly by. Kind of like you were saying, Dave, as we were setting up for the show here, and you know we've been we've been used to the sun, you know, being up till eight mm -hmm. eight thirty, even yeah. you know nine o'clock at the height at of summer, and yeah. now it's dark at 7 30 and you know when the time changes it's going to be dark before we even leave to come over here that was a yeah. comment okay so that, let yeah. me uh, let me read the comment here in a in a grammatically sensible way <laughs> um one day as a one-year-old is one three hundred and sixty fifth of your life when you're 50 it's one eighteen thousand two hundred and fiftieth of you, your life dave is spot on thank you appreciate that but does that i i realize that that mathematically is true but how does that that mathematical effect affect your perception of the passage of time that's yeah, what it is everything is relative you know it's... Jeez. it's just so bizarre everything is math dan Yes, I know. Everything is math. Yeah, they even had a show about that. Yeah. Physics remember that is show, everything. Dave? What was that show about math? Everything's math? Do you remember? No. I do no? Not. no. You should. It was called Numbers. Oh. Numbers. Oh, yep. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Didn't make it past three or four seasons because Numbers. <laughs> <laughs> but don't. Oh, we need the numbers. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, so we were talking about how. You know, it, it was dark before we started the show. Does the does the days getting shorter affect your mood? I think sometimes when it starts to, then I get used to it. But you know, do you know that the you know that when we have the longest day of the year, it's the beginning of the summer, and then for the rest of the summer, the days shorten. Yes, I did know that. That's mm. why they call it the summer solstice. Yep. Mm. Yep. I think we get ripped off. <laughs> you think summer should start sooner? I think, yeah, I think summer should be, the middle of summer should be like the summer solstice. I think that's sad, but it is what it is. Mm -hmm. What do you think of seasonal affective disorder? Is that a real thing or is that like an in-your-head thing? Probably a little of both, I would say. You know? Pat, do you get more moody when it's uh, dark out? It's definitely more depressing. Is that a yes? I'd say so. Then you do have night people who thrive at night and don't like the day, you know? It's like when you get done class and you're doing homework, it's like dark out already. It's like, no, like you, you show up when it's kind of dark out mm -hmm. for class, and by the time you leave, it's dark it's dark. Out. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the one thing about, you know, working in the cigar retail at a place like Twins. It's going to be dark when I leave and dark when I get go here. home. Yeah. You know, it's coming kinda, and going. It's dark. Yeah, that gets that gets bad. Um, are you guys picking up anything different on the cigar here at all? I'm getting a kind of creaminess from it when I pair it with the drink. I have a creamy t texture of uh, espresso in my mouth. Is anybody picking up on the uh, citrusy kind of notes every once in a while that I was talking about? I'm experiencing those again myself. Hmm. Maybe for a few seconds after a, a good pull. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dave. Okay. Pat, how do you think this is going with the uh, Woodford? It's um, it's adding kind of like a a rugged kind of dark earth. It's um kind of moving the oak wood back, and then it brings the black pepper a little bit more. 
out on the retro like it doesn't like like that simulating sensation doesn't increase but it kind of like is more of like a peppercorn mm -hmm. so it's it's definitely i wouldn't say it's a it's weird because you'd think it would be complimentary but it's a little bit contrasting if that makes sense like i i think it it does maybe change takes the, the sweetness away a yeah. little bit like it's not really that hickory sweetness i think like that citrusy note that you're referring more to more woody oak notes yeah like i'm getting <clears throat> it's like a little bit more bitter so that sweetness is more of like that citrus like you're talking about to me mm -hmm. um one of the things i wanted to talk about tonight was this recent report in half wheel that mm. i think had everybody kind of uh up in arms a little bit um about uh the idea of a proposed ban in the biden government on nicaraguan imports and um, uh, the half wheel report uh says uh, in what would in what could be a major disruption to premium cigar industry were it to be implemented, the Biden administration is reportedly considering blocking the import of Nicaraguan products to the United States amidst increasingly strained relations between the two countries. In an article published by voiceofamerica.com, a U.S. government publication, quote, Two top U.S. officials, unquote, told the publication that the administration is, consider is considering the import ban as relations between the two countries continue to deteriorate. The article does not indicate whether it would be a complete or partial ban, though its effects could be felt across several sectors of the economy. In 2019, the U.S. imported a total hmm. of $4.3 billion worth of goods from the country with the top imports being apparel, gold, electrical machinery, meat, sugar, coffee, and cheese. Have you ever had Nicaraguan cheese? Have you seen Nicaraguan cheese in the grocery store? Probably had it and didn't know it. Like on that cheap pizza you like or something? Mm. All right. Uh, the relationship uh, between the two countries, i.e. Nicaragua and the United States, has deteriorated over the last five years, especially following the 2018 civil rest in Nicaragua. In 2018, Nicaragua's government, led by President Daniel Ortega and his wife Rosario uh, Murillo, who also serves as vice president, uh, announced that it would increase taxes and reduce pensions. Protesters, including large groups of students, took to the streets to oppose the move and the government at large. Uh, the Ortega regime responded with crackdowns using both police and paramilitaries on these protesters, including hundreds of deaths, thousands of imprisonments, and even more who fled Nicaragua. Last year, Nicaragua held disputed elections that Ortega won in a landslide after many of his opponents and critics were jailed or fled Nicaragua. <laughs> eh, that does have a little bit of a... It's a little bit of a... You can impact the election if you put uh, your rivals in prison uh, or, or worse. Since then, the government has sought to silence the critics, including political opponents, religious figures, and media. Um after Russia invaded Ukraine, the U.S. government warned Russia's few allies, of which Nicaragua was one, that there could be further consequences for supporting Russia. In May, the New York Times reported about an alleged planned meeting between Loriano Ortega, one of Ortega's sons, and a senior U.S. State Department official ostensibly to talk about sanctions. The report says the meeting never happened after Ortega got cold feet. Hmm. In June, Nicaragua allowed Russian troops, planes, and ships to enter the country, something that has led the United States to call the action a regional security threat, although this is something that um, I think happens every year. Right, Pat? That's Twice a year, you said? Twice a year. They have some program that militaries which Ru russia's one of them can come in and like kind of police and train and do stuff of that nature right uh so it's not something new it's something that's going on no they do it for I think, two times a year is what yeah. i read 
Shortly after the U.S. responded with economic sanctions, the Biden administration dropped Nicaragua from a list of countries that are allowed to ship sugar into the U.S. at low import tax rates. In June, sanctions were imposed on Nicaragua's state-owned mining company, uh, Eniminas, and the president of its board of directors. These were the third set of sanctions um, since November 2021, when the U.S. Department of the Treasury announced sanctions against the Nicaraguan public ministry and nine Nicaraguan officials following what were deemed to be sham national elections. And then in recent weeks, the Ortega regime has been in the news for its crackdown against Catholic clergymen and nuns, including the recent arrest of a prominent bishop, the expulsion of the, mister, uh, of the missionaries of charity, the congregation founded by Mother Teresa. Catholicism, uh, the article says, is the largest religion in Nicaragua. And when it comes to cigar imports, Nicaragua is the leading exporter to the United States as well. So, obviously, if the U.S. were to totally ban imports from Nicaragua, we would all really feel the the impact of that at all of our oh, cigar yes. stores. Um, that said, since this uh, article was re released, I have been running through the, the internet trying to find any updates or facts as to whether or not this is actually moving forward or if it was just an idea that was presented and thrown out there and i can't find anything to collaborate that this is something that is actually moving forward have you been able to find anything pat no so, i mean it's clickbait <laughs> it's a um <clears throat> publication so it's not like a very credible source um you know if you do any further research a lot of the things like it, it's a very condensed article mm -hmm. so if you kind of expand on it a lot of the details that make it kind of look better aren't really included in it so hmm. i don't really know how much there is to fear as of right now i'm not saying that it's not a thing but right. as of from what i can gather and find i don't really see that this is like an immediate threat to the industry yeah i haven't i haven't been able to find any kind of collaborating follow-up to this other than it being proposed i don't really know what it's about which leads you to to you know ask the next question which is if there really isn't any kind of action that is out there to report is writing this worth doing or i mean or should we have you know should people have waited maybe until there was actually something to report i mean it's like it almost is like they're reporting that somebody said we should do this and now there's a whole article that's been written about hmm. somebody said we might do this and might to me doesn't meet the qualification of like news in most cases yeah i mean it's something to i guess talk about you know i, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that people are getting educated on the topic mm -hmm. in case it ever did become a problem and just not gonna you know come out of nowhere like oh next week we're banning imports from nicaragua but you know it's one of those things where it's like i think it was the way I read it, it seemed like it wasn't like a definitive thing, but it was kind of put out to kind of concern people. And I feel like maybe a disclosure would have been proper. Like this isn't like happening currently. It's just being conversed about. What major about. brands would be affected by it? Padron, AJ, I mean, everyone. Drew One Estate. day has a new factory that they're making. Yeah, Drew Estate. Placencia. Yeah. My father, yeah. Tatuahe. Um, <clears throat> so would, so would, slow it, so would Black Label, right? They're based in Esteli. I think yeah. almost every company would, because a lot of companies use <laughs> Nicaragua <laughs> tobacco. So I, I feel like, I mean, I, I don't know how it would work, but for instance, like say Fuente gets Nicaragua tobacco imported to the Dominican and they make a cigar there. I don't know if that's going to be 
able to be imported here to be you know what i mean i, I don't know how again they don't really there's nothing really in the article to tell you like what i mean they said that it's not confirmed whether it's going to be like a partial ban or like a like a complete ban so mm -hmm. like I, I don't know what the purview of the ban would be you know so it's kind of hard to tell but i mean if they just outright said at the minimal like no nicaraguan imports directly from nicaragua obviously I mean, that's, that's, what, gonna... that's what it would be i mean you can't ban products that are made in other countries that utilized materials from nicaragua that nicaragua legally has export to i mean you, you know what i mean i mean we we import um how would that be different than us buying cuban cigars from like europe and then selling them here how would it be different from us buying oil from russia I'm saying if if it's not direct, then like obviously we can't sell Cuban cigars. So how you know what I mean? Like, it's it doesn't matter where it comes from. It's you can't do it. Well, you know one of one of Cuba's biggest exports is also sugar. You know, um, sugar gets exported to Costa Rica, and you know. Companies like Hershey's get their sugar from Costa Rica. It has some, there's some sugar that they buy that originated from uh, Cuba in there, but it's not, they didn't buy it from Cuba. They got it as part of a mix that came from somewhere else. You know, can you really, you know, would, would one of the workarounds be like Padron opens a factory in the Dominican Republic and has all of their stuff produced there and then sent to the states that way you know are there would that be a workaround to something like this it would almost be kind of like a like two things one it would be kind of like a history repeating itself of cuba like the cuban revolution where all the talent from cuba left cuba and went to nicaragua i think mm -hmm. it would be a similar kind of thing where a lot of people would flee Nicaragua and then maybe go to the Dominican. Honduras is becoming a pretty prominent um, manufacturer country. But um, that or, I mean, again, I'm not, I haven't researched the topic too, too much. So this is just kind of in a, more of an opinion and possibly this is just not true. But I mean, with Habanos increasing their MSLPs by up to 300%, internationally it's almost like maybe nicaragua can just go all in to the international market and then not mm -hmm. have kind of the handicap of america i think the smaller companies would fall under but i think right. some companies could probably make a transition to seize the shelf space internationally and just how, kind of carry through how there. can habanos get away with raising its prices by 300 percent i mean I they are it's what they're doing but i mean how do they how do you how do you do that I mean, you know, here in here in the states, you know, if a cigar goes up by twenty five cents, it's like almost outright revolt, you know. So when you have a five dollar cigar that's now fifteen dollars, I mean, how does that? How are you able to to keep people wanting your product and not trying somebody else's? I feel like it's just because of notoriety and internationally. I think Habano's products is kind of what I would correlate Padron being mm -hmm. in like an American humidor. So you have like that kind of following and it's like, you know, nothing's better than a Cuban. And I don't think people have really been exposed to, I guess, the new age of cigars, because again, it's really, for the most part, it's really not profitable to be in Europe, you know, mm -hmm. internationally rather, because it's the taxing and, and just like it's not really a big return you know like no so I, I feel like that's probably why it's just because it's always been there and people it, it, notoriety behind it yeah it's got to be something like that because there are other companies like um you know i can talk about because you know um in the pipe world you know gawith hogarth which is made in england and distributed in England, you know, they are, uh, their distribution is now out of the United States because it's so, the taxes are so prohibitive over there. Um, it, it, they got priced right out of the market. So the they actually 
switched their distribution network into the United States. And, you know, different companies in the States can, of course, send stuff to Europe, but the prices, you know, stay more competitive that way. Hmm. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of ridiculous how that works. That's why I think if, like, well, since Habanos is increasing their pricing so much, like a lot more companies might start trying to seize the market over there because now they mm -hmm. can talk about being competitive. You can <clears throat> up your price and your price still not over a Cohiba a hike right now. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I think that's a likely thing that's going to happen. Now, I've had $75 cohibas before and before the hike the hike in the price um you know was it good yeah w was it a 75 dollar good i don't know i i, I wouldn't have paid for that mm. um but you know there are obviously people that do, do you, i mean do you, is it really just the whole cuban hype all over the world i mean people talk about the the hype of cuban cigars here in the states because you can't legally get them and that brings up something else you know i i had some uh younger dudes come into the shop this weekend and ask for cuban cigars and i said we we can't carry cuban cigars they said why not i said because of the embargo and they said what embargo and I said, you know, back in 1963, you know, we had the embargo against Cuba. Was that because of drugs? I said, no, it was because of communism. And they were like, but we saw Cuban cigars on TV last night. I was sure that we would be able to get Cuban cigars here at the shop. And he, the person wasn't joking. They were serious. Mm. I was like, no, you, you can buy them wherever they're legally sold. They're just not legally allowed to be sold here. And they were miffed by this. And it, it, while they were miffed by that, I was miffed by the fact that they had no idea about the Cuban embargo or what that was about whether or not it had to deal with drugs. I mean, it was, you know, people just seem to be, oh, if, if not, something you know, has not, not happened, in school if, if days, something you know. has not happened on YouTube in the last two years, it probably has not reached a kid's mind. Pat, you're like nodding or are you bouncing up and down trying to stay awake? Processing. Processing. Do you think there's any legitimacy to that opinion of mine? I mean, it. I mean, I haven't met anyone yet that doesn't know anything about the <laughs> Cuban embargo, so I don't have much of an opinion. Here, you weren't here Saturday morning. <laughs> I mean, it's again like if if they're new to cigars, then in that aspect of things, I wouldn't expect anyone to know. But I know, you know, I think it was probably like middle school history. We we dove into it pretty extensively so i'd be kind of shocked if they were never exposed to at least like the parameters of what the embargo was. i mean you play a call of duty video game you probably know a little bit about the embargo right like these <laughs> yeah. days i mean if you yeah. played call of duty you know about it's the embargo. you know it's yeah it's uh, that is a little shocking that they didn't know anything about it yeah now dave your your kids recently got out of school mm. i mean relatively to pat and myself and you i mean were they taught about that do you know mm -hmm. yep they they know about the uh i mean they went to pinkerton and that's a pinkerton yep pinkerton that's a pretty prominent school mm -hmm. they um yeah i mean we've talked about it in yep. what aspect did you talk about it dave well i share with them the you know They've been interested in like the whole cigar thing, so we talk about. And plus, we've talked about JFK, Bay of Pigs, stuff like that. We've seen the JFK movie, you know. We've heard about it from there. You talk about that as if there's only one JFK movie. What JFK only one, movie did you the one watch? With, uh, damn it, the only one that matters. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one called JFK. <laughs> Why is that the only one that matters? I don't know, because it's the only one that I know of. 
I don't know any other one. It was a major blockbuster movie. Oh, my. Has anyone smoked the glass and wondered what the cigar actually does to the uh, Woodford? Nope. <laughs> I think it makes it much sweeter. Add I can't, some think, sweetness of, I to can't it. think of the actor's name. It's funny. It's Kevin Costner Thank is who you, you're Dan. trying to think of, Thank Dave. You. Um, it, it, it's funny. The, the sweetness is taken out of the cigar, but the sweetness seems to be ramped up in the Woodford when you actually smoke the glass. Dave is smoking his glass right now. Mm. Pat is just watching Dave smoke the glass. <laughs> okay, Dave, I think it's... I think. Sorry, I was reading comments while I was turning. Uh -huh. It's an audio podcast, Dave. Drink, yep. uh, wow, I tell, give me a second here. I'm reading and looking. Yeah, I would definitely say that the uh, smoking the glass makes the Woodford a lot, uh, makes it more sweeter. Sweeter, smoother. Mm. Uh, I know we've talked about it on the show before, but... Uh, mm. this Retro kind of, is on fire, though. Kind Ooh. of a pastoral confession, especially with a cigar like this, if it had a partially unfinished foot. Um I just I, I need to bring it up again how important it is not to rush lighting your cigar. You know, I I you know see so many people just hold, you know, get their torch, hold it, you know, like within a quarter of an inch of the cigar and just let it fly and you see flames flying here and there and um yeah, it it does. It lights a cigar really quick. But if you a cigar like this, you really want to very gently light because that unfinished foot, that wrapped, the the wrapper that's wrapped around the, the foot of the cigar is supposed to be gently lit and it's going to light the cigar for you. So you really just need to kind of get it started and then it uh, uh, goes through. And if you um, really rush that and overheat the cigar it's going to totally change how the cigar performs as you as you do so i know pat i know you've kind of followed in the footsteps of going from a torch to a soft flame you know what what appreciable difference do you have now with that it's more of like the um the pre-light ritual kind of so it's um I don't know, I, I think it's more of, like, a, I'll quote Carlito, it's more of, like, flirting with the cigar. You know, it's not mm. as fast and efficient as a torch, but it's more of a, like, I don't know, it, it, it just takes more finesse to do with the soft flame. And then also, like, the, I think the room for error is a little bit less with the soft flame because it's not as hot as a torch. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that, you know, when I started using a soft flame to light the cigar... Like the foot of the cigar would be like that bleach white ash, mm -hmm. opposed to when I used to use a torch, which I also I didn't use the heat of the flame on the torch either. You know, mm -hmm. I would keep it. Yeah, you were very good about it. Yeah, but it would still kind of get like that darker kind of foot, and I did notice like a big difference, at least with the first inch of the cigar using a soft flame because it it just seems you're to you're heating just... up the tobacco as opposed to burning. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it, I you know I'll still use a torch to do touch ups and everything too. I think there there's definitely a use for them, but no, I think it's definitely I've had a more yield of success using a soft flame. Yeah, I I I use a torch when I'm outside, but if I'm inside, and I'm one of those fortunate people who can actually smoke at my house, I get to smoke at work. Why? Because I work at Twins, and um, you know so ninety percent of the time I'm using a soft flame lighter. Um, either an, an I am a Corona or a Caribe or my DuPont to light the cigar. And I can actually pick up appreciable differences from cigars that I know very well using the soft flame versus the torch. Plus, if you're smoking a PS Tabato, which is what a closed foot's called, mm -hmm. um, well, I think... Thank you, Pat. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> the... Is that what happens when you close your feet? But the... 
the, the saw flame is definitely better to light that because if you're using a torch i, I think you're rushing through the brad i think that flame was a little cold on that cigar just just saying <laughs> Yeah. You know, you, you rush through that beginning light, and I think when it's a soft flame, you can focus more on the flavor <laughs> and the aroma from actually burning the wrapper mm. upon the light of it. So, and I th- that whole you know the whole, one of the things I love in tobacco this university is that you know is the the idea that the the lighting of the cigar is part of the enjoyment of it, and so rushing through that you know, is, is rushing through one of the most exciting parts of smoking a cigar and enjoying a cigar is, is getting that thing going. And as you're um, taking the time, spinning the cigar in your fingers back and forth, um, slowly heating it up, hearing, smelling how that changes the cigar, the little bits of smoke that come off the bottom uh, of the cigar, smelling that, uh, yeah. that's all part of the enjoyment. It's part of the process. It's, it, it's part of the relaxation of doing a cigar, enjoying a cigar. Um, what's our final uh, verdict here on the uh, Bishop's Blend Corona Largo? Well, the, the construction is right on. Mm-hmm. Um, I have the draws to touch this up. Yeah, the draw has been beautiful. I love the 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 espressos, the black pepper, and the retro hill is absolutely intoxicating. I think it pairs very well with the Woodford. <clears throat> um, I like it. It's good. Yeah, the uh, construction was definitely on point. It's like that, like sipping through a straw kind of draw. So it's like, not much resistance, but just enough to kind of pace your smoke and not get one of those little pointy canoe tips. Um, mm-hmm. it, the flavor profile was really, really good. If you like, kind of like those more fuller body, dark kind of cigars, like it doesn't have, it, it, the sweetness was a good touch. I think it lost the sweetness at the halfway point, to mm-hmm. me at least. No, it did for me too. And it has like a nice like savory oak, that kind of rugged earth, some nice spice on the retro. And then I was getting kind of like, it wasn't like a sweetness, but I was getting kind of floral there. And then that citrus note came out there too. So yeah, I'd say it was a nice addition. I'd be curious to see if it's the same cigar every year if it's a little bit different every year or... yeah this is the first one i've had so mm-hmm. i can't speak to the previous iterations of this um unlike the uh, carolina small batch which i've had the last several years of mm-hmm. um and that's what we're going to be smoking in the second half of the show we're going to take a break right now and when we come back we'll light up with the latest release of uh latest release of carolina red flake from cornell and deal we'll yeah, be back
All right, everybody, we are back, and now we have switched over to the pipes, and we are smoking Carolina Red Flake, the 2022 release from Cornell and Deal, another uh, in the pipe world, one of the most celebrated uh, releases of the year. And uh, from the website, it says about uh, what we're smoking, an inspired blend of the finest North Carolina-grown Red Virginias. Carolina Red Flake is Cornell and Deal's tribute to the historic Old Belt growing region. Taken straight from fertile Carolina soil, these exquisite top tier Virginias are all grown, threshed, blended, and then lovingly pressed and carefully sliced right in the heart of old tobacco country. Combining a hay-like grassiness with a subtly sweet tangy note, it's a Virginia purist delight with a complex flavor. Rich, deep, and earthy, with subtle hints of dried fruits and citrus. This year's edition of Carolina Red Flake features matured TA-20 red-orange tips, the same grade as last year's Carolina Red Flake with Perique, boasting a substantial natural sugar content of 13.53%, and all sourced from a single-family farm in North Carolina. Mm. It's manufactured by Cornell and Deal, by Jeremy Reeves, uh, of course, it's all Red Virginia. It's a Virginia blend. There's no flavorings on this. It's a flake cut tobacco. And um, mm. the plan was to uh, pair this with uh, Elijah Craig. I think I'm the only person who's drinking the Elijah Craig because mm -hmm. nobody else finished their previous pairing of yep. Woodford <laughs> enough to uh, warrant that. So I guess I'll talk about Elijah Craig and how it uh, pairs with the drink everybody else will be talking about woodford because we don't want to get totally loaded on the podcast here um first impressions i know for both of you this is your first time smoking the uh nor the uh carolina red flake which officially hits stores tomorrow uh so we're actually smoking this the night before it comes out officially speaking which is a, also a very cool thing. And like I said at the beginning of the show, this is the seventh release mm. of uh, Carolina Red Flake. Uh, both the Bishop's Blend and this cigar started in being yearly released in 2016. Uh, so this is the seventh iteration of this. Of course, each year with different Virginias, different grades, it's going to be a little bit different from year to year, but it's always North Carolina uh, grown red Virginias. Um, Dave, you are a Virginia connoisseur mm. on the podcast here. Yes, what sir. do you, what do you think of this year's release? I, to me, this is the sweetest I've had yet. Like this is really sweet, very, uh, datey. I would say more than raisiny. Um, a little bit of hay, a little woodiness, um, but it's very sweet. <laughs> in my Dracula pipe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about you, Pat? What do you think? Getting like a figgy raisin kind of sweetness on the front has kind of like a sourdough kind of texture to it. Yeah, it does. Yep. The, um, the retro definitely has a good amount of baking spice. Really? Baking spice? Yeah, some cinnamon, some fig. Timid spice. Is it timid spice, Pat? Baking spice. Baking, Baking spice. Baking spice. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. Yep. I'm really when happy. When I say with this baking year's spice, release. I mean, you know, it kind of has a little bit of cinnamon, like that brown kind of pepper in it, a little bit of figs. Brown and pepper. What's, what's brown pepper? Mm. Brown I'm pepper. Asking. Is that like don't get not up, quite don't so get up like that. I'm asking. Like what's, cinnamon, what's brown make it? pepper. Cinnamon, fig, in between anise, white and black. Mm. You know those kind of spices yeah, yeah. no i agree with you saw it's just more simple to say baking spice because baking spice is you know one term opposed to four different spices mm -hmm. and it, it is much more there there is a real spice to this tobacco yeah but it's not a pepper spice it's not white it's not black it's not red baking mm -hmm. spice you know it's more of a baking spice kind of a thing mm -hmm. and uh it's very very good you know i've had the the 2019, 2021, 20, this is the fourth of these that I've had. Um, I think to Dave's point, you know, this, 
obviously it's going to be the sweetest. I don't think they've done uh, a blend where the sugar content was as high in the Virginias as this one. The last couple of years, at least, uh, the sugar content was around eight and a half percent. This is at thirteen and a half. Yeah, uh, the the Sun Bear Virginia was like twenty four mm -hmm. from from Canada. You know. Yeah, that was very very sweet stuff. But as far as the the Carolina, Carolina Red Flake, yeah. I don't think they've done one that's been as sweet as this. And uh, I'm really liking it. I'm digging the the dark stewed fruit kind of notes it's very earthy that um uh baking spice that pat's talking about is definitely there um uh my own tin that i got for pre-market release research is uh almost gone <laughs> that may be because this pipe holds like a quarter of a tin <laughs> in a bowl several flakes just folded together um it's very good stuff um what are you know i, I guess it, there's no way around it you know again kind of getting back to the whole thing with time's flying by you know fall is coming mm. and you know this this you know weather wise this is a great time of year you know it's in the 70s usually you know um you know one of the things i've noticed that i'm kind of uh, i don't know the word for it it's just something that i've noticed it, over the last several years as we've gotten toward the end of august you can see here in new hampshire very obviously the leaves starting to change and i have not seen that this year mm. even now it is very very green which to me is kind of ironic because we have not had a super wet summer no yeah. as a matter of fact there's a lot of uh towns and counties are on water bands uh still around here and yet there is more green today than i can remember there being at this time for the last number of years and if I remember right, last summer was particularly kind of wet and rainy. So, you know, um, I'm enjoying the fact that the green is kind of hanging on there. But as we as we start moving into the fall, um, is this a season that you guys look forward to? <clears throat> or is, you know, are, are there things you like to do this time of year? with uh, yourselves or your family or, or your significant others or your parents, Pat, <laughs> um, what do you, I always look forward to the release of Oktoberfest. That's like the, <laughs> the signature of fall to me. I love Oktoberfest. Picked up a 12 pack, saw it for the first time, mm -hmm. you know, that came out like several weeks ago. So I didn't see it until like the other day, a couple of days ago. I was just like, hmm. I wasn't really looking for it per se either. But no, why would you be looking for Oktoberfest in in like August? Yeah, that's when it when it comes out. You know, typically for the last couple of years, anyways, mm -hmm. it's come out pretty early. Do you still, you know, drink a lot of Oktoberfest? Uh, you, yeah, for the beginning of the fall, you know, until it's gone. It's usually gone before freaking Halloween, but mm. you know, it's definitely one of my one of my favorite Sam Adams. It's funny, my my two favorite Sam Adams are Summer Ale and Oktoberfest, and I tend to use them more for cooking than drinking. Mm. Yeah, Oktoberfest in a stew is absolutely amazing. yes. You make a you make a beef stew with Oktoberfest. That's yep. great. Yep, no water, just the the Sam um. Adams, yep. Sam Summer is great in chicken soups and chicken based stuff. It makes it because of that little kind of lemon and citrus that's mm -hmm. in there. It, it cold snap would be good with that too. Cold snap works well with that too, yeah. but in my to my palate, not as well as summer. Summer, mm. um, you know. So I have I have a case of those at home right now too, but. It, it's it's more as a cooking, cooking. thing instead of a drinking thing. Mm. You know, yep. I'm still more of a, 
I like darker ales. I like I like ports and porters and things like that more than you know. I just you know when I get together with Brett, you know our Tuesday night guy. Obviously, I'm not often there anymore since we're doing Tuesdays. But when I get together with Brett, you know he's an IPA guy, and I'll have IPAs with him because that's what he he likes and and uh, I'm not very familiar with all the different offerings out there, so he'll he and I'll you know I'll just kind of follow whatever he's drinking, and that's good, you know. But my still my go to is still much more of a darker thing. I've had a more of a growing taste towards sours lately too. Really? Yeah. What kind of sours or examples? Um. Like there's been like this blackberry sour that I I, I had at um the uh, the one right up the street from Twins, Kelson the the backyard oh. was it the or, but the uh, no I don't remember it was called like berry something I don't know <laughs> but wow um, it was really really such really an good. impression of that. Uh, uh you know speaking of all this Sam Adams stuff we we need to have uh. The Sam Adams girls back on the mm -hmm. show. We need to have Catherine and, yeah. and her buddy back on the show. Pair it with Oktoberfest. That'd be great. Well, that might be good. I think I'll reach out to them and see what they're doing. Um, have you tried the uh, uh, tobacco with the drink yet with your Woodford? I have. Mm-hmm. <laughs> However, the retention <laughs> has not been retained. So I saw a sample again. Surprised. Yes, yes, yes. Mm. Definitely brings the spice out. It's more of like a mm. occasion spice, like that earthy kind of red pepper. Yeah, I would say it definitely brings the earthiness out and puts uh, a little bit of the sweetness down. Uh, Puts a little kick in the retro hill. The tobacco leaves kind of like a pepper heat on your palate too after you take the wood for it. Mm. Mm. The Elijah Craig does very much the same thing. There's a lot of that heat that's left on your palate after having a, a draw of the pipe. Um, brings out some more woody notes in the tobacco. Um, but I don't know that it changes it all that much. Mm -mm. That the uh, Elijah Craig is something I have not had enough to really be super familiar with, which probably makes this part of the podcast. And it and it also <laughs> makes to me it also makes the Woodford a little sweeter. What the smoke does to the Woodford. Do you agree with that, Pat? Mm hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I think the, the sweetness does kind of linger. Like if you exhale when the spirit's like in your mouth, it definitely has a like kind of a sweet kind of lingering residue. Hmm. So when you take a drop from the pipe, it... See, it still makes it a lot more, like, earthy and, like, that kind of red pepper. Like, the mm -hmm. sweetness is mm -hmm. there, but it lingers in the palate. Mm -hmm. So it's more of, like, a pre-draw ritual of, like, having that kind of that sweetness linger for the retro. Mm -hmm. And then it gets, like, that dark earth red pepper. Mm. Now, for those of you watching and wondering where uh, Debris is, um, Debris did uh, contact me via text you know, during the first half of the show, and you know she's she's in uh, 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 school right now. She's doing uh, all sorts of stuff with that. She's with a uh, actually a um, supervisor doing a, a supervised education with you know in, for her psychology degree, psychology degree. And because of this, that, and the other thing, she wasn't able to make it tonight. Uh, she'll be with us later. But, um, you know, that, you know, 
you know, leads to another topic of discussion here, and that is that that Shell is not here, and Shell has had to step away from the show for a while um, because of, um, you know, th just the way things are at work right now. He's working a lot of nights, and to have another night away from family was just tough. So um, we have um, all kind of agreed that he's, you know, at least for the time being, stepping away from the show. But um, what are some other, what are some ideas for making that up? You know, for having a, a kind of a regular fourth person on the show. Do we do we? go for guests do we try and get a regular person on the show uh to kind of take shell's place until things i, I think we just in the do, future, we go or all we just... out and we do everything we get more guests we get you know you know try and get a fourth person do whatever you know let's experiment let's have fun with it that's what i think you know you have Maybe lower the points from three thousand down to a little lower for someone to be on the show. Lower the points. Yeah, because it was like what three thousand points, and you get to be on the show. You're talking about five star. <clears throat> five star, yeah. You know. Yeah, no one's ever taken advantage of that, Dave. I I, I don't know that. Uh, well, that's because it's three thousand points. They'd rather get a box of cigars. I, you know? I don't know that for a thousand <laughs> points, people want to be a guest on the show. I, it should I, be I like think... five points. <laughs> <laughs> Your first purchase. There you go. I don't know. Probably not that low, but. Pat, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think we get the new GM on the show. Mm. Yeah. I think that'd be a good idea. Yeah, you know, his yeah, expertise. Get Sean, Sean on the show. His... We tried getting the old Sean on the show, and, and we, we did yes, finally yes. get him on, and it was that was very, very good. We had a lot of fun with that. And to answer your question, Sean, this is not a Christmas pipe. This is a Dracula pipe. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Twins GM, uh, Sean Fails, is actually in the audience right now watching, so... It's kind of funny that we're talking to him about maybe being on the show. Be good. He did end up having to uh, make a sweet little pipe purchase, um, which maybe he would actually use if he were on the podcast. Um, otherwise, it's just kind of decorating his mantle at home or something, you know. Um, we got an extra headset over here, Sean. Christmas? <laughs> Christmas? Is that what he said? Christmas? Um, one of the things that I'm excited about is that right now we're, um, in the middle of testing a new blend for twins. The, uh, next we've released two, uh, tobaccos under the 724 Briary blends banner, Boston tea party being the original and then queen city, uh, being the uh, latest release, Boston Tea Party was a uh, uh, burly blend, and um, uh, Queen City was a Virginia Perique. The next one's going to be in English, and mm. we have been smoking the three different blends that Jeremy Reeves has sent us for that. And um, you know, I when when I when we did the the uh, original tastings for Boston Tea Party and for the um, what ended up being Queen City um, to my palate at least it was very easy to pick the the blend that was actually ended up um, being used by us they were both very standout very unique uh, blends in their own right. And, um, we've had some great, um, you know, Boston tea party has been a huge, huge hit. We've recently just had, um, some really great reviews, uh, both on, um, um, tobacco reviews.com and from, uh, Jay Furman who, um, kind of follows the twins pipe club and, and, occasionally listens to the pipe uh the the podcast here he has his own podcast that he does on pipe tobaccos 
um, and they both thought that uh, mm. um, Queen City was a, a top rate Virginia Perique. Um, I've had a much more difficult time with the English blends, and that may be very much because I'm it's um, English blends just aren't what I smoke on a regular basis. I frankly tend to be more of a Virginia Perique guy. And so I, you know, I kind of, I, when I, I've talked about it on the show before, so I won't belabor the point, but when I started, you know, into, into pipes, um, 20 something years ago, I got right into the, the English blends real quick. English and man. I think I just burned my palate out for Latakia based blends mm. and I still enjoy them, but it's like a one bowl is enough kind of a thing whereas other people that's that's what they do are um you know english blends uh tobaccos so you know we got three different blends to test that were labeled a b and c and as i smoked them my favorite was b followed by c and a i thought was kind of just your market typical English blend. Mm. That was not your impression, Pat. You had almost the opposite of of myself. Yeah, you, you chose your C, chance, right? Or you, you thought... B B was my favorite, followed closely by C. Like I could I could go back and forth between B and C. Yeah, I, I eliminated C. You eliminated and then C. My number one was A. Your number one was A. So your number two was B. Yeah, I Might think that. There. Dude, I mean, I think I gave you the notes on it, so I can't really remember. I remember C was. Because just looking at the other pipe tobaccos we've chosen, I think that, like, um, even with um, Boston Tea Party, it had a uniqueness to it because that mm -hmm. T note. Yeah. And then the Queen City had a uniqueness to it. Mm -hmm. Um as well which you could probably speak more to that than i haven't had in a while but with the three that we've been choosing for the english i think that c to me was like a traditional english mm -hmm. i think i could have i could probably get that in like a lot of other current tobaccos in the market yeah um a had a unique sweetness to it that i've rarely had in an english mm. and then b had more of a subtle sweetness but i think it had like a red kind of Cajun pepper, which yeah, I thought that's was, what you said in your notes, yeah. which is unique to in English to me at least. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of gauging, you know, whether that sweetness or that spice would be more of what I'm looking for, and subjectively, spice because that's just what I like. But mm -hmm. I think that the sweetness in A is well, I'm just very much stop unique. by and try and smoke some of this stuff. Yeah, well, you should because you know. This Saturday at Pipe Club, uh, which goes on at London Dairy from 12 to 4, uh, I'm going to be sharing all three blends with the people who show up there. There's a lot of English-loving people at mm. that uh, Pipe Club, and um, I'm hoping they're going to help me kind of figure out uh, if one of these three blends is the one or whether we need to move on and look at some other, look at some other blends. What's unique about these is that um, both uh, A and C, if I remember correctly, were crumble cakes, whereas B was a flake. Hmm. And um, C could actually be produced also as a flake, and it, as well as a crumble cake. And I've actually reached out and kind of, I'm, 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 all, I'm trying to see if maybe I can get the uh c blend as a flake because i think that would totally i think that would change how it smokes and since it can be produced both ways i i kind of am interested in seeing how that would change um uh, uh how the blend performs in the bowl mm. you know but um um 
while we're talking about events, uh, one of the things we should talk about is that this month we have a major Drew Estate event going on. Yep. The Drew Estate Ultimate Tailgate event, which culminates in a big tailgate party at Twins Londonderry on Friday, September 23rd from 4 to 7 p.m. Um, it's going to be taking place up at the deck, and um, that uh, event is going to go like this. Um, you get to uh, be part of the tailgate party by purchasing a 10-cigar uh, pack of uh, Drew Estate and Hoya de Nicaragua cigars, which are going to come in a uh, Drew Estate um, uh, Undercrown Sun Grown 10 Count uh, um, Travel Humidor. It's about a hundred bucks worth of stuff uh, outside of the of the uh, travel case. So you're going to get about hundred and fifty dollars worth of stuff for the hundred bucks. And then there's going to be an all you can eat tailgate party um, that includes burgers, hot dogs, sausages. Uh, it's going to include several draft beers, uh, and uh, it's also going to have a um, uh, a place up there on the deck where you're going to get first dibs at um, the September shipment of Liga Pravada number nine and T52 mm -hmm. and 10th anniversary Robustos, which are going to be up there, um, and there's three big giveaways that go along with this event. And uh, the first is open to anybody who either buys that pack and goes to the party or anybody who buys four or more Drew Estate cigars between now and September 23rd. You're going to get a raffle ticket uh, towards a portable hot tub i didn't even know these things existed until like a month and a half ago portable hot tub it inflates it deflates it comes with the pump it fits four people in it it's got everything you need to run it the heater the the uh cover the uh filter all that stuff all the chemicals you need in order to keep it running smooth are all included in this that's like a $550 thing right there. Uh, someone is going to go home with a personal portable <laughs> spa and hot tub. I think that's freaking awesome. I think you need to win that, Dan. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I would love to win that. Mm. And then, um, so anybody who buys four uh, or more, for every four Drew Estate cigars you buy at a time, you're going to get a ticket between now and then for for that event. If you uh, attend the party and you buy that 10-pack, you get another ticket. If you buy um, a Liga up at the party, you're going to get another ticket for that. And in addition to the hot tub prize, there are two other um, unique uh, drawings that we're going to have that are only for people who attend the party on the 23rd. Um, and all, all those tickets that you, um, get are going, you know, at the event, when you mm. buy the, when you buy the league of cigars upstairs, they're going to go into the drawing for two boxes of cigars. One person is going to leave with a box of Liga 10 anniversary Toros. Mm. Nice. Another person is going to walk away with a box of Liga H99s. And Brad is saying he's walking away with both. That may very well be true. I don't know. But the only way you can get entered to win the box of Liga 10 anniversary, 10th anniversary Toros or the box of uh, H99s is to actually have one of those party packs for 100 bucks mm -hmm. and be at the party. That's the only way you can do that. Um, the hot tub, that's a general prize that's going to be available to anybody who buys 
Drew Estate or Hoya de Nicaragua cigars, which they distribute between now and the 23rd. Again, anybody who buys four more of those gets a ticket. If you don't get your ticket, go back and get your ticket because somebody just was trying to, to tilt things away from you. So go get your ticket and and uh, get in for that. That is going to be a great time. Nick Laramie, Nasty Nick, the Drew Estate, uh, Repford, New England is going to be there. It's going to be an awesome time, awesome party. There's going to be – I'm really looking forward to this event. Mm. Really looking so, forward to this event. Sounds like a good time. Yes, it yes, will be it a good does. time. It will be a good time. Are you guys feeling like the Carolina Red Flake is developing at all as you smoke down the bowl? Is it staying the same? What do you think? You've gone back to your cigar. Did you smoke through the bowl already? Yep. I need a bigger <laughs> bowl. You need a bigger bowl. Yep. Did you like it? Yeah, it was really good actually. It's um since I've basically that is a Christmas pipe. Um it it so at the midway point of the bowl was my favorite, so it got a lot more intense. I think mm-hmm. that, that that kind of sourdough note that I got kind of got more pronounced. Like, mm-hmm. it wasn't like I'm eating dough, but it got, like, that really kind of, like, savory, kind mm-hmm. of creamy, thick texture on your palate. That that kind of mm-hmm. set the bar for the Virginias that just popped, and it, it was a lot more of that kind of fig that sweetness it wasn't quite a raisiny sweetness it was more of like uh i want to say um it's actually kind of i really don't know i i guess stewed fruit would be stewed fruit would be the most yeah would be probably be the the closest closest one but yeah it was really good and then by the end of the bowl like the the spice actually on the back third kind of Mm. comes out forward and it gets more of like from that baker spice more of like a really strong like I want to say like an anise and cinnamon an anise and cinnamon. yeah like not like anise but anise Neither. anise <laughs> dave what about yourself um i this is definitely my favorite carolina red flake it's the sweetest of them all um the uh, the stewed fruits as pat said you know i totally agree with that deeper in the bowl um uh, the you know like the the figgies and the dates and stuff like that kind the of figgies. like meld into like a more of a stewed fruit um that baking spice kind of like retro hail is really prominent with the with the uh, wood for here uh this is definitely also my my favorite pairing really what what did you your favorite I, pairing tonight or yes your favorite? my favorite pairing tonight yeah what do you like about it um i love I feel like uh, it helped the sweetness to me. It didn't take away from it. Like uh, I feel like in the in the cigar, the sweetness was kind of taken away from it. Um, uh, I think it be- brought out more of like the uh, the spice in the retro hail, and I felt like uh, it didn't change too much of the Woodford, which uh, which was really cool too. So I got to enjoy both. You know, for me. This adds a huge vanilla note to the Elijah Craig. Mm. Uh, that's a marked difference. Um, so it really does have a profound effect on the on the Elijah Craig. Um, I can't speak to the Woodford. I finished mine. There's none left. What can you do? Um, you want to do a little would, would you rather? We can do some would you rather. Yeah. Did you have a would you rather to preempt my would you rather? I'll let you, I'll let you have this one down. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll start with Pat. Would you rather, Pat, be assumed to be smarter than you are? Or, or... be assumed to be a better lover than you are? Ooh. If you want to be my lover. Smarter. You'd rather be assumed to be smarter yep. than you are. Spoken like an academic. Yep. Any particular reason why? <laughs> well, I, I don't typically get a second date anyway, so the lover thing's not going to be much of a no. detriment to me. So. <laughs> All right. What's would... going on tonight, Pat? 
<laughs> you aren't dating anybody? Yeah. You're very single right now? Yeah. Booty call night? I'm just asking. Who's that guy breaking your car out there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's your girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> I got some problems in there. Holy <laughs> that puts a tang in putang. <laughs> uh, Dave, what about yourself? Would you rather be assumed to be smarter than oh. you are or a better lover than you are? Well, <laughs> no, the first one isn't going to happen. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, bagels. <laughs> it starts with the letter B. <laughs> uh, I don't know. That's a tough question. You know? Why is it tough? <laughs> I guess because I could really care less. I don't know. I, I, I don't really. I don't know. Pat Pat seemed to have an answer right off the top yeah. of his head. I don't really give two figs what other people think of me first, so. Yeah. I don't know. I guess I'll, uh, I don't know. I guess I'll go with the smarter one because that's the impossible choice. The impossible choice. Yeah. Well, the reality, Dave, is you, you, you actually do have a very high IQ, if I recall. Yes, I do, but that doesn't mean anything. That's just potential, which obviously hasn't been <laughs> realized. <laughs> yeah, you know, a lot of drugs. Don't do drugs. <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, well, the content of the show is fairly <laughs> suspect tonight. Um, I think if I were going to have to choose, I I think ah <clears throat> uh, see. <laughs> It's, <laughs> Thanks. It's it's fun when Rod you says about you it, go smarter. Other people think about it. Rod's, but when you have to, Rod says Rod says to go smarter, improve chance of winning an argument mm -hmm. <laughs> when you're married. So <laughs> I don't yeah, know about that. Yeah, the yes gear that. still happens. I don't yes, know. The, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Um, I don't want to. Uh, uh, She's never wrong. She just changed her her mind. I don't want to <laughs> underperform in the uh, the uh, uh, lover category. So I guess I would prefer to be assumed that I'm smarter than I actually am. If you're going to have to meet expectations in one way, I would rather meet them that way. Mm. Very unpastor answer you just gave there. Um, really? <laughs> Rod also asked what he missed about the Nicaraguan tobacco bar. You're probably just going to have to reverse the episode. Because <laughs> I don't think we want to go back into it again. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's basically over. But you can go back and re-listen or re-watch and uh, hear what was said that way. Um, next week, we're going to be doing our uh, <clears throat> quarterly review. This is uh, something that uh, Pat started uh, in... Uh, an idea that Pat in, uh, had us do to start reviewing the cigars that came out in a particular quarter of the year. And that way we kind of get more prepared for our cigar of the year and uh, um, pipe of the year uh, review. And let me see exactly what we have on tap for next time. We're going to be doing the uh, uh, West Tampa uh toro we want to do the light or the dark 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 <laughs> so the west tampa black that's what it's called right west tampa black i think so yeah yep west tampa black toro and we're going to be doing uh the mcbaron virginia number one mm, which is new. uh new, yeah, twins. new to the store <clears throat> has been one of the uh, best-selling virginias uh, out there for a very long time. Sounds like I need and to get some. Uh, new to the store, uh, we're going to be smoking that. So hopefully mm, you'll be month. here next week. And I'm going to be working to make sure that Bree's on next week so that she makes up the fact that she missed the show. Mm -hmm. We'll see if that happens. Uh, oh, twenty acre, twenty acre farm. It's a good cigar. Yeah, yeah. we're going to be we're going to be doing a uh, show for the um, uh, 
you know, preceding the Drew Estate event. Liga 10. <clears throat> oh, Liga 10. Yeah, Liga we 10. want to do Liga 10. Liga Sorry. 10. Yeah, 20 yeah. Acre is going to have to take a back seat to that. Yep. But uh, we will do the, the uh, 20 Acre at some point. We need to do that. That would be a good cigar to do on the show. Anyway, so you know what's coming next week. Don't be late. Next Tuesday, 8 o'clock, we'll be here. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.